Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. Richard Garassi, President of Wagner College, and thank you all for being here for what is a special night. Thank you. Uh, it's rare that you're able to have three so accomplished people on a panel in one place at one time. And we're so appreciative of Maria and Dick, um, excuse me, Jack and Susie. I want to also thank Dick Grasso, who really helped this evening come together. Thank you so much, Dick. Dick is sitting right here. This island, as we all know, was hit very hard by Hurricane Sandy and still in recovery. And um, when someone asked me about Wagner College and what it stands for, I said, we, as we know, some of us who we evacuated the campus, those of us who were left, slept on this gym floor the second year in a row that we slept through a hurricane. And uh, we lost power, and 95% uh, of our students we had sent home to places across the country uh, to take as many friends as they could with them. But we, received, we returned power on Thursday of that week, and I don't think it was a day before our students from remote locations created WagnerCares.org. And they, their motto was, small school, big impact. And we've been involved in Sandy Relief since then. And I think that really sums up what this place is really about. We have wonderful students. They want to do significant things with their lives. They have no sense of entitlement. They have only a sense of achievement and a real sense of civic purpose. So I, I, I really am very proud. I'm proud that you have a chance to engage with them tonight. I, as I said, I wanted to thank a few people, Dick in particular, but I also wanted to thank uh, Don Crooks, Professor Don Crooks, who will introduce our guest in just a second head of our business school. And also, I wanted to thank Betty McComiskey. Where's Betty? Somewhere along the way here. Betty has been an army unto herself that's getting this organized. And all the folks on our staff, my chief of staff, Joe Romano, and a few other folks as well. So without further ado, let me introduce Don Crooks, himself a longtime uh, veteran of Wall Street, now a distinguished professor here at, at uh, Wagner College. Don, would you come on up? Thank you, Richard. And thank you very much for starting this whole process about six years ago. It's turned into a real event at Wagner College. And before I thank anybody or introduce our esteemed guests, I'd like to let everybody know that this is for our students. And the students are the ones that drive this whole process. So we finally, I have to reach out to my professional colleague and my dear friend, Don Vito at Santennial. Without Dick, we wouldn't have been able to get some of these uh, wonderful guests himself and Ken Langone, and now Jack and Susie Welsh and Maria Bartiromo. Maria Bartiromo, who we haven't crossed our paths on Wall Street, is the local kid that made good. Grew up in Bro Brooklyn, attended NYU, a degree in journalism and economics. 1993, she's working for Lou Dobbs. She says, I want to leave. She said, don't do that. He said, don't do that. She goes to CNBC and becomes the first woman who ever reports from the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. That's, not, that's such a mean feat that when I worked on the floor in the mid-60s, there were no women allowed. And Dick, you could probably back this up. I think it was the Queen Elizabeth, or Queen Mary wanted to get on the floor, and that changed the whole thing. So she broke the glass ceiling, first of all. But Maria has won two Emmys, one for the Bank Talks Collapse, the other one for the Mind of Google. She has the Closing Bell Show. She writes numerous articles. And the one thing you don't know, which I told you before I would tell a story, oh is that when I left Lehman Brothers, I actually went to Bloomberg for a screen test to become an anchor. My head is crooked. I talk too fast. And I say all those bad words that Wall Street is saying. But the one thing I left them with was this thought. I said, CNBC is kicking your butt. They have this woman, Maria Bartiromo. She's the total package. She's smart, she's easy on the eyes, and she's tough as nails. <laughs> Two weeks later, Bloomberg hired um, Paige Hopkins, who, who is a, a Cameron Diaz knockoff. And then I started watching <laughs> Erin Andrews on football, and all these young ladies. So Maria didn't crack the, the glass ceiling. She shattered herself, and she didn't even know about it. So we welcome her here. And, and I still watch your show all the time. And I do have stories to tell you. Thank you. <laughs> Susie Welsh, who uh, went to Harvard, Law School, Harvard Business School, a Baker scholar in the top 5% of her class, editor-in-chief of the Harvest Business Review, has been on Morning Joe, Oprah, 
uh, Good Morning America, you name it. And I like the idea of her work-life balance. As someone who worked on Wall Street, and we only worked 120 hour weeks, no problem. With five children, it was tough to balance. But Susie did it. And her book, 10, 10, 10, is great on making decisions. How is it gonna affect you in 10 minutes, 10 months, and 10 years? And it gives you a chance to step back and look at things. She co-authored the book Winning, and Winning the Answers, and writes the weekly column in the Business Week with Jack. So we welcome Susie also. Last but not least, Jack Welsh, local boy from the north of Boston, Salem, goes to the University of Illinois, gets a, a PhD in chemical engineering, gets a job at GE, and he's gonna quit. He doesn't like it, it's too, too much of a bureaucracy. He likes the small atmosphere. He does stay, thank God. From 1981 to 2001, the core value of GE grows 4,000%. The value of the company goes from 14 billion to 410 billion. And he's just a regular guy, kind of gruff, likes to communicate. You always know where you stand with Jack. One of the things I mentioned is that here at Wagner College, we have really benefited by you. We now, through two of our alum, Kathy Danner and, and Natalie Proffis, introduced me to uh, Lean Six Sigma. Donna Powers, Dr. Donna Powers, sent me up to Long Island Jewish Hospital, and then I went to get my black belt in Lean Six Sigma. We revamped our entire executive MBA last year around Lean Six Sigma, and we have four black belts teaching in the program. So I want to thank you for that, Jack. You didn't even know about that. The other thing you didn't know about, I invited Commissioner Monty here to tell you that the Honeywell deal was approved, <laughs> but he couldn't make it. And as a wonderful woman once said, her name was Grace Welch, don't kid yourself, kid. That's the way it is. The way it is is Jack Welch, the manager of the century, according to Fortune magazine. We are honored to have him here. Thank you so much, John, for those generous introductions. I just want to say I'm so thrilled to be with my two really greatest mentors and supporters throughout my entire career, and that is Jack Welch and Dick Grasso. Thank you so much. So we have a massive treat for us tonight. We have the leading voices on leadership, really, on business, Jack and Susie Welch. And they write, and they visit, and travel, and learn so much, and are going to impart that information to us tonight. You know, I thought we'd start off with students, uh, given that we have the stu some students in, in the room tonight. And here we are talking all the time about a weak economy, an anemic growth story, and of course, unemployment that is persisting. How are these folks in the room going to get jobs? Lay out the strategy that they need to have when they graduate to actually get a job and keep a job. Susie. Um, well, it can't start when you graduate. I'm sure you all know that. I'm sure your parents have mentioned that to you. Um, I'll just stop to say, oh, well, Jack and I are also very happy to be here. Thank you, Marie. It's great to be with you. Um, if you are starting to think about where, where you're going to work upon graduation, uh, you've lost some time, um, and internships are increasingly important. But um, uh, that sort of more obvious stuff aside, <laughs> Jack and I have been thinking and talking about this idea about where you go to work in a weak economy a lot over the past couple of years. One of the reasons is that two of our kids have just come out of college and so we are thinking a lot about where they're going to go uh, because we don't want it to be back home. And. Uh, <laughs> although they seem to want that. Um, and so we, we recently, a couple of years ago, started to get excited about a concept called area of destiny. And let me just briefly describe what this is. The, the thought is that eventually, um, over a long period of time, most people end up in their area of destiny. That term is pretty self-explanatory. But what it really is, if you sort of think about that territory as being at the intersection of two superhighways, one of the superhighways would be what you are uniquely good at. What you are good at, what you're better at than most other people, okay? So what you're uniquely good at. And that doesn't have to be like I'm uniquely good at engineering. It could be I am uniquely good at making people feel comfortable. Or actually, I had a wonderful uh, dinner partner tonight, um, a student here who said, uh, I said uh, right off the bat, said I'm uniquely good at isolating problems. Okay, So what you're uniquely good at. And the other super highway is uh, what you really love to do. 
what you're passionate about. When you've got 20 things to do in the day, that one thing that you're really looking forward to doing. The intersection of those two highways is your area of destiny, and you need to be thinking about that the day you enter college. And, as, and, and find internships that sort of will move you. To, your first job won't be in your area of destiny, but that's the destination. So uh, that is a very philosophical answer to the question, and, and perhaps Jack has a more, uh, a more concrete one. Well, I, I have a comment that uh, goes like this. You will never have a <clears throat> assignment you should work harder on for homework than the preparation you have for your first interview with the company. You should know everything about that company. I've seen so many kids come in and wing it. You want to know what that company's market position is. You want to know what their share is. You want to know what the CEO's interests are. You want to know what the person you're going to interview with interests are. Do more homework on that than any silly damn homework assignment you got at Wagner College. This is what you want to really study. And so go at it like a savage and prepare for an interview so you knock the socks off the people that you're interviewing. And, th and that is without question what most young people don't do. They come in and say, here I am. What do you got? So it's a real assignment that I'd like you to take on as you think about interviewing and meeting people that show up on campus. And it's great advice, really. And, and what you're saying is take money out of the equation, figure out what you love, and figure out what you're good at. What you're, uniquely, what you're uniquely good at, because the money will come when you get those two things intersect. And what you're saying is make sure to do your work. Do the homework on that first company. Uh, why is the first one so important? Well, I, I shouldn't have said the first, on the first interview, because that's your impression. I mean, right now, on, on unemployment, whether it's 12, 13, 14 percent, you pick a number. It certainly isn't the number that you publicize. Um, well, that's, let's you. explain that for a moment, because the unemployment rate is, I believe it's 7.9 percent right 7. now. 7.9 uh, percent. Uh, no, no, 7.7. So what is, what is 7.7. 7. 7. 7. My apologies. So if it's 7.7 percent, that is only measuring the people who are actually looking for a job. There are a lot of people without a job, but they simply are so frustrated, they've stopped looking. So when you actually put that in there, uh, it, the, the number is much higher. The government releases the other number, and the media reports it. Right. I didn't mean to offend you. Marie. No, 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 I'm not offended. <laughs> You're I'm getting offended. your Italian now. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. <laughs> um, so let's talk about that for a minute. Why is unemployment so persistent? What is it going to take to unlock the strength and vibrancy in this economy? And let's face it, we're five years after the financial crisis. We should be farther along, shouldn't we? If we had an administration that liked business, it might help. And um, so, without question, this regulatory burden is insane. And if you're seeing that the public is now seeing the pettiness of the, of the leaders in this administration. You're seeing the FAA with these controllers putting people through two and three hour delays. There's all kinds of ways to create $600 million in a $3.5 trillion budget. And one of them is not punishing the traveling public. And so you see that every day in a new labor law. You see that every day in a new environmental law. You see it, and it's just crimping business to where people don't want to take a chance. So people are doing more with less, fighting every day using overtime, using other the overtime hours are up big, using every technique in the world not to put somebody on the payroll because they don't know what health care costs are going to be. They don't know what pension costs are going to be. There's too much uncertainty. Mm. You just can't have it. And so that's a real slowdown. But you know, I got a little vignette. Susie and I were in China two weeks ago, speaking to uh, some audiences there. And the press got up in the middle of the audience and said, you know, looking at me with some gray hair saying, you know, it's a lot tougher now than when you were there. Basically, they were saying that, you old fellow. Uh, they were basically talking about how much, how tough it is now. The, 
The GDP is only growing at 7.7 percent. It's a real slowdown. Competition is brutal at 7.7 percent. I said, you want to go to Frankfurt or Pittsburgh or Detroit or Berlin and give that speech you just gave me? I said, they'd shoot you right in the place. 7.7 percent? It'd be a party. So uh, China, China is fiercely competitive, fiercely coming on, and uh, when we were in Chengdu, at one of the, which is one of the economic growth zones, uh, one of the entrepreneurs said to us, we can start a company in Chengdu in one day. In one day. They can get all the regulations through. And so, I mean, that's, we're not and, growing and, and we're not... And the mayor made that point, Susie. The mayor was making that point. Right. That they will, they have just made life very easy for business. And by, meanwhile, uh, you know, we are living in fears. Our, our daughter works at a company where everybody is being outsourced. There's just nobody on the payroll. They're slowly but surely just sort of having, you know, outsourced, uh, you know, one-person shops do all the work. And it's, it's not like a company. So these things all add up. And meanwhile, we've got the competition from... Uh, China. So. Yeah, particularly when you look at the U.S. economy growing at about 2% or so, you've got 7.7% in China, but is the U.S. benefiting from some of that growth going on outside of the United States, like the 7.7% uh, yeah. we're seeing in China? Well, yes, but we're, we're also being hurt terribly by the ridiculous position Europe's in. I mean, Europe's in a real recession. There's no, no other word to use for it. It's been in that for a year. It's a long recession, not a one quarter or two quarter recession. So you've got companies like Spain. I mean, we all know about Greece, but Italy's in trouble. I mean, every, every one of these peripheral countries are in trouble. And it's seeping into France now. France is a negative GDP this quarter. So, and most of the U.S. companies, whether we like it or not, we talk about developing countries like China and India, etc. Most of our trade is with Europe. That's where the real trade is. And, and they're all being hit hard. Mm, that's a great point. The, the issue in Europe stems from debt. But what else? No. has put Europe in this precarious position. There are cultural um, uh, issues, uh, and uh, Jack and I were in Portugal six, seven years ago, and uh, we were giving a speech, and um, uh, a photographer came to take a picture for the local newspaper, and um, Jack struck up a conversation with him, and, and they started talking about work, and the photographer said something like, what's wrong with the three-day work week? And I looked, Jack looked at me, his eyebrows went up, and he said, you got people wondering what's wrong with the three-day work week. So there are certain uh, cultural predilections, and uh, later, when we gave the speech, we met with all the sort of leading businessmen of, of uh, Portugal, and Jack mentioned this and they a shudder went around the room and they said this is the problem as we have a workforce that likes the lifestyle the the, the lifestyle that is afforded by um, a socialist uh, kind of setup and of course programs that support the people right and um, basically very large government to keep people on uh, yes a certain run, a social movie in, run a movie in Europe and five to seven years from now if we keep on the same trajectory you'll play the same movie well, here. let's talk about here because yeah. we have, we're having a national debate right now about entitlements, about cutting things like Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security, uh, or they could go bankrupt, and at the same time considering putting spending in place, putting stimulus in place, fiscal policies in place. What's the right move? Well, I, I don't pretend to know all the right moves, but I would certainly say that when we're spending more in 2013 than we spent in 2012, and we're having these crises about slowing the rate of growth, we're not cutting anything. We're, slow, we're having arguments about slowing the rate of growth, $85 billion. $85 billion is 2% of the budget. How many of you couldn't cut 2% out of your household bu budget, out of your company's budget? I mean, come on. It's the stupidest arguments in the world. And if we had a media that was reporting things right, we'd have the right discussions here. So, you're, so you blame partly the media for... for... For being campaign managers for the current administration. Mm -hmm. That's a view. Yes. <laughs> how, many, how many in the audience are thinking about this issue, the fact that this country does face $16 trillion in debt? Does this, does, does, does this concern the people in the room? Yeah. yeah. 
So this is, this is something that we're all thinking about, obviously. Um, the debate is, if I'm going to cut these programs now, I'm going to hurt people who are already walking on ice, walking on, on eggshells, if you will, because they are struggling. They, they are, it's, it's a struggle to keep up. Right, that's the argument. That's the classic argument is that if you take away entitlement programs, there's no safety net and people will suffer even more. And you can go around, and that is why we are, where, one of the reasons we are where we are. The conversation keeps going around and around and around. And in the meantime, we have out of control growth and I mean, out of control spending and no growth. So uh, something has to galvanize. I think the, one of the things that goes on is that most Americans, maybe everybody in this room raised their hand, but most Americans just you know, maybe because of our wonderful um, optimism. I mean, that's one, a wonderful American trait, but just nobody believes that freight train is, is coming. And, and we've all been in Union Square and, and near NYU, and you, you see the number of the, tra the, the debt up on the, and people just walk right underneath it. I always sort of stop and stare at the debt going up and up and up. And I, But I think typically, and it's a good thing about America, but a bad thing, nobody uh, is willing to stop that conversation and say, we're we're about to pay the price. Maria, just step back for a second and think about this $650 million cut in con controller's pay, if you will, so they're furloughed one day out of 10. You've all read that, right? Well, at the same time, last week, the Department of Transportation issued a $450 million grant to 10 communities to improve the quality of life in the communities. The same amount of money, two-thirds of it, handed out from one pocket and cutting back on controllers and slowing down the whole economic system. Come on. Today, this was really out there in the news, and it has been, because all the airlines are, are cutting back, and they're canceling flights, and everything's delayed, and so they're blaming the sequester. What should they have done in terms of the sequestration they should, have, they should have taken the bill that was proposed in the Congress to give the president authority to be CEO of the country and make the choices between this and this. Trade-offs that Mark Abramos does this every day. Everyone in this room who runs a business or a home makes trade-offs. I'll go to the show or I won't. I'll buy tickets to this or I won't. Make the trade-offs. They turn that option down. They want to be punitive. They want to take it out of each one equally. And that is a way to just create trouble and cause a slowdown in confidence in the economy. Nothing else. The idea that they turn down the bill, rejected the bill, to make trade-offs between departments, between whether a kid goes to this college or that college, or goes to this camp this summer or not. All the trade-offs every one of us makes in our life or has made in our life. There's no trade-offs now. This bill says you'll take out of each bucket the same amount. So it's intentional to make the public feel that, well, Congress allowed this to go on, your lives are going to be you take a hit, and you're going to feel it. Even though they could have said, well, look, LaGuardia, JFK, this is a very busy airport, let's keep the controllers there. Yeah, no, this airport is slower, let's right. take jobs from there. Or, or let's not give the $450 million quality of life grant to 10 cities. This year, let's wait till next year when we have the money. I'm just trying, I mean, just try, in an effort not to be political. I mean, do you think that knowing that the president, at the end of the day, it's, 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 the onus is on him to, to get, lead this country toward, back toward growth. He, he's okay. You think he actually made a decision to say, yeah, let's do it that way. At knowing that at the end of the day, he will be blamed? In my opinion, his whole administration right now is all about 2014. If I can make it ugly enough in this country where people are in pain all the time by the actions I take, they'll throw those damn Republicans out of Congress, I'll get a Democratic Congress, and I not only will have a health care bill, I'll have a hundred other ones that are better than that to, for his agenda. That's a view, but that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's talk about business or something Let, let me else. ask you this, Susie. A minute ago, you mentioned <laughs> entrepreneurialism, and you mentioned an entrepreneur in China, which really was very impressive to hear that. It's nice to see that that's what's happening. 
um, and it's just one case. But what about entrepreneurialism? What about the folks in this room? I mean, you've got lots of options these days. What do you, what do you think about starting your own business um, under the umbrella of what you said, what you're uniquely... Uh, right. In many ways, it's the only option for kids coming out of college and business school now because there are so few jobs that are available and it's so competitive for those jobs because business schools are churning out kids who uh, have decided to go back to business school because their companies were downsizing. So there's this huge glut of MBAs. And so in many ways, becoming an entrepreneur is your best bet. Um, but the thing that makes it possible to be an entrepreneur is not the desire to be an entrepreneur. It's a great idea. Okay, you can't just want to be an entrepreneur, right? You, it, it's like it'd be like saying, I want to be a star, but not being able to act or sing, okay? I mean, it's a beautiful idea. You've got to have a great idea that changes the game. Otherwise, you know, figure something else out. Find that idea. But I do think that if you're going to be an entrepreneur and you've got an idea, it is going to be in your area of destiny. It's going to be in that area where, um, you know, you're uniquely good at something better than other people, okay? Um, and what you really love to do so much so that you don't even want to sleep, you want to do it so much. That's where the entrepreneurial idea is going to be. But if it's not a great idea that introduces a new service or a new product to the economy, um, it, it's not going to make it. Right, but I mean, it, there's so much of startup activity going on across the country right now. It's, Has it become easier to start your own business? Not easier, but it's, it's an opportunity that's better than it is going to a big corporate bureaucracy that isn't growing. And the, uh, we had a, a, a young man at our table tonight sitting in the third row there uh, say, who, uh, who basically has started a, a business in, uh, on the internet. And he was telling us great stories, been going for a couple of months. He's uh, turned on, he's not trying to not knock on the door or IBM or Microsoft or somewhere else. He's out doing his own thing. And it's exciting. I can't think of anything better to say, take a swing at. And when you're at this age, why the hell wouldn't you take a swing? You can't take a swing when you get a family and you get all these obligations. But when you're at this point in your life, take a swing. We met this, this young woman from, from Wagner at the beginning of the, of the session today who's starting up a, a, an incubator operation in conjunction. Grasso better deliver on this too. He's, Grasso gets all this credit here, but he promised this woman uh, two years ago that if she went after this, he'd help her. Now we're right in the pinch point, so get on Grasso because Wagner will have a great program if she can pull it off. You know, it's true. It's, well, you've got to do this stuff when you're young. Actually, recently my sister was telling me a story that her son, who works at an advertising agency, um, 70% of the people were fired, I, I guess. They, they lost a huge account, and you know he got a huge pay cut. And I said to her, thank God it happened now while he's 27. And she said, what are you doing? What? We're upset as hell here. I said, this is fabulous. Look what the lesson he's going to learn now at 27, because the last thing you want it to happen is 10 or 20 years later. You said large corporation. You mentioned Microsoft, IBM. Let's talk about some of these old big dogs that are not growing anymore. I mean, Microsoft uh, is have, has, the stock hasn't done anything in a decade. IBM, they're lucky if they get revenue growth of 2%. I know you've been working with Microsoft. What's the problem at Microsoft? Mrs. Welch did not bring up a fool. Yeah, really. <laughs> you don't think he's going to answer that one, Murray. <laughs> but, I'll, but, but, but I'll tell you, Microsoft is underappreciated. They've got great products and great people, and when they get it all wired right, they're going to win big. I, I'd bet on, my, on Microsoft. But I think, in general, when I talk to the kids in the, in the audience here, Susie and I have a theory of the case that any manager over 30 is dangerous. Why? The world is changing so fast. If you've got a... I just... That's why I'm hoarse today. I've been meeting, meeting for two days now with, with, with private equity companies, all line companies. And the digitization of these companies and the globalization of these companies and the energy, these are all air conditioning companies. These are all widget companies. And we're starting to grow at seven, nine percent by changing our relationship with customers. Think of Amazon. Think of Amazon when they send you a book suggestion. After you bought one, you get pinged for the next uh, 10 years on, you might like this, you might like that, you might try this, you might try that. Every company's gonna think that way. And if you're in an old line company, you don't think that way. 
you've got to know so much. So, so, so you can talk about big, big data and the stuff that big data is doing. There's so much data out there to be grabbed. You can, you can, there are, there are software, there are kids in garages we talked about who have come up with packages that of pricing analysis, where you can do pricing that costs you pennies if, you, if you're comfortable with doing it, where you can do inventory management for pennies. If you've got an IT person, they used to walk in and they'd say, hi, I got a new IT project. It's a hundred million dollars and it's four years. Shoot that person right in the office. Because you can do it now for two, to, for, in two years or six months for two million dollars. There's all kinds of software now. And if you've got people that aren't constantly refreshing themselves, and if your organization isn't getting the eject button on those that aren't acting 25, you've got to change the company. You can't carry these people who were good, loyal, wonderful people going forward because today it's all about IQ, not EQ. Remember, the 90s were all about getting along. Teams, let's just have emotional intelligence. Now you better have raw talent and raw brains because the world is changing so damn fast that I'm telling you when, you, when you see what can be done today for little money, because smart entrepreneurs like this fellow in the, in the second or third row are doing out there, you can grab this in so many companies. And companies that are doing it the old way aren't going to grow. I'm so going to ask you about yeah. big data in a moment, but, but I want to stop you there for a second, Jack, because what happens if you've been in the workplace 20, 30, 40 years, and you feel that you don't understand some of the new technology? Yeah. How do you bone up yourself, putting aside hiring these 25 and 30 year olds? How do you get that skill set and make sure you're constantly refreshing yourself? What do you do? You got to do it. You got to. How? Got, you, you go back to school. You uh, you reverse mentor with a 25 year old. You pull them aside and say, "Tell me what you know." I mean, we we've gotten letters when we were writing our column. I mean, one of the most common letters we got was from people who said, "I'm 50 years old. I don't know what they're talking about anymore." I go into the meetings, but you let yourself get there. I mean, we had a recent incident where we saw somebody in, a, in an organizational setting where they were talking about Twitter, and he was like, oh, shucks, I don't do that. Well, why not? I mean, wh what's wrong with you? I mean, Jack's on Twitter. People who are 100 are on Twitter. I mean, you know, you can't sort of say, well, that technology is for the new people. Well, then you, you've, just, you've just made yourself completely obsolete. But why Twitter? I mean, I how mean, do I know Twitter is more important than Facebook, is more important than Google Plus? And you've got to know what they all are. I mean, you can't pick and choose. If everybody knows about it, you've got to keep yourself current. And, and that attitude that you're going to let some kind of knowledge go by, is, is, it's just defeatism. You're going to defeat yourself. So Jack, what Jack is saying about this every manager over 30 is dangerous is if you're not if you're not under 30, sort of in the mix, learning stuff, and you're not thinking and acting like one, you know, um, then then you're 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 putting yourself out of a job, and you've got to fight every day to stay current. You can't give up the ghost. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff, but empty your head of the stuff that doesn't matter anymore. I mean, we all know what it feels like to think there's just too much going on in there, right? You got to empty out some stuff that's not relevant anymore, and start and put that new stuff in. Or else you're not going to be adding value, and 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 you're and you're making yourself uh, irrelevant to your company, and to, and you're hurting your own career. For a long time, it was just data. You had data in the computer or in the server, and that's I mean, you know, when you were running GE at the peak, it was just the data in the computer. It wasn't all this other data. Yeah. But now your car is is technologically advanced. Your washing machine is talking to you. Your pictures, your camera, your iPhone. You got all this unstructured data which is big data. Right. What are the implications? Well, we don't know yet. I mean, big data is now this new catchphrase. Everybody's talking about big data. Big, big data basically means now that your car knows when you go to the supermarket and it tells, it tells Whole Foods when you're coming and they know exactly what you're going to buy, so they push it towards the front of the shop. I mean, it's frightening, actually. And the government knows where you're traveling because of your easy pass. That's I mean, also part and, of big and, data. And, you know, the other day I was thinking, gee, I need new sneakers. So I sort of was online and looking at sneakers. And, you know, for the past 48 hours, you can imagine what my computers look like. I'm being served ad after ad about sneakers and gym clothes and I mean they know big
big data. So what is it going to mean? It's going to mean that there's going to be um, a, a much higher anticipation of your customer's needs. You're just going to know so much more about your customer. And the companies that win are going to be the ones who know how to mine that data and use that data. And the companies that lose are going to be the ones who suffocate on that data. There's going to be so much data, it's going to kill you or it's going to make you. But there's going to be data like you've never seen before. I want to go to one more. Yeah. Let, let me tell you the story. All, all things come full circle. When I became chairman of GE in, in 80, in 82, I got rid of a bunch of businesses that I didn't think would go anywhere. And one of them was called laminates. You know, Formica tops, laminated tops, you see them in, in like Corian and other things. You see laminates with patterns for kitchens and other things, trying to look like granite, if you will. And so I got rid of that business. It was a, it was a bunch of presses that went like this. Uh, and pressed the, this paper to come out with laminates. Well, this week, on uh, Tuesday, I had a, we had bought a company called Wilsonat, which is now larger than Formica. In comes the Wilsonat team. And instead of the old presses and inventory and fumes of phenolic lying around and all this stuff, this team that's now number one in these old laminates is talking to me about how they deal with the customer and the architects, because the architect is specifying the, ki the kitchen, then the contractor gets told how to do it, the, the housewife or the man pick out what, the, what they want the countertop to look like. Well, that's now just like buying a car. When, you, when they, we go online, build your own car, change the dashboard, change the features, that's what they're doing with laminates now. So there's no inventory. It's all, it's all bought online. The architect is online with the factory. The, the builder is online with the architect and the factory. That's all one quick cycle. So they want something, they get it in 72 hours. The pattern they want, we have no inventory, it's delivered to them. The same business 31 years later. I'm staring at it and I felt 101 years old. Looking at it, but you also said that's a really good business now because it's been completely digitized and it's now it's an exciting business. Whereas you dumped it, now you were ready to uh, grow it. It's a whole new, 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 new business. It's unbelievable how businesses. Nothing is an old business anymore. Only the people running it are old. It's a very good way to put it, and it's a great story, Jack. Look, I want to open it up to questions in a moment, so do, do get ready. But as, as we finish this circle um, on technology, is there a downside to all of this? I know the train has left the station. There is no more privacy. And all of this data uh, is, is with us. But these hacks and cyber attacks, how worried should we be? Oh, I think they're really dangerous when you think about nuclear plants, when you th think about oil rigs. We need cyber protection, there's no question, because it can be the next nuclear bomb, if you will. If you attack a, a nuclear plant, if you attack a, a, a power plant, if you shut down an airline system overnight, I mean, of course, there are all kinds of downsides. Can we get it, though, cyber protection, without I think we're regulating the internet? We'll stay one step ahead of them, I hope. I mean, I think that if they, if the, if we can, if the government and companies can employ the, the best brains, we can maybe stay a few steps ahead of it. I, I, I think there's another. I mean, I think we know about the, the, the incredible dangers of, of, of really what's cyber terrorism. But th then there's also the personal uh, side of it, which is most of us, none of us are, are ever off. I mean. You know, I, I know I'm not the only person in the room who wakes up and looks at my BlackBerry first thing in the morning. So, I mean, you know, we've lost that ability to also turn off. And there's actually something really important about turning off and, and, and being crea and feeding into creativ creativity and innovation. So I think there's a lot of costs. They'll, they'll sort themselves out. I'm more optimistic than, than pessimistic. We have microphones in the room. Raise your hand. Questions for Jack and Susie. Um, and the microphone will come and get you. Right there. Yep, all the way in the back there, and then we'll come here to the blue shirt, the gentleman in the blue shirt, yep. Hi, my name is Christian Hanna. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my question is for you, Jack. Um, 
when you became CEO... Speak up, please. It's hard to hear you. I'm sorry. Um, That's better. Much better. My name is Christian Hanna. I just want to thank you guys for coming uh, this evening. My question is for Jack. Uh, soon after you became uh, uh, CEO of General uh, Electric in 1981, you implemented this strategy of being first or second globally in simplicity. How did you go about implementing that strategy? How did I go about Being first second. or second in any what, business? How did you do that? How did you implement that? Is that the question? Yes. Uh, we put out very clearly, we're going to be number one. We had 140 businesses. We were proud of being like the Queen Mary. That was the, our, our motto. We're like the Queen Mary in rough seas. I wanted to be like a speedboat. In, a, in an alley, okay? And so we, we, we talked about the different philosophy of speed. And then we said, if you're not one or two, you've got to fix, sell, or close. And we said, who was number one and number two and who wasn't? So everybody in the place knew who they were. Everybody knew what they were. And then when we sold these businesses, to companies that were better than us in that business. I'll never forget, I sold the air, air conditioning business in uh, Louisville, Kentucky uh, to a company called Train, which you may all be familiar with, which is a very good air conditioning company. A guy named Stan Gorski was running the business. I, after the transaction took place, a month late, later, I called Stan and said, Stan, how are things going? He said, Chuck, I can't believe it. It's so good. He said, let me tell you. He said, I wake up in the morning and my boss loves air conditioning. He thinks about air conditioning every day. He thinks I'm great. All you did was bitch about air conditioning. Hated me. Hated the game. <laughs> he said, this is so refreshing. The team won. We, we weren't good at it. They became number one in air conditioning with train. The, the reason private equity exists is that I'm in private equity now, among other things, and we go out and we buy companies like air conditioning companies from big fat companies like GE, where they're orphans. Where you buy orphans where the company is ignored. They, like IBM sold them. Lenovo. They weren't going to do well in, in PCs. Lenovo's doing very well. They're number one in the business now. Hmm. So you go buy these businesses. The people get rejuvenated. They become leaders. It's not cruel. It's the best thing in the world for, for both companies. The companies that buy it and the companies that sell it and the people that go with it. That's the only way to think about it. Thank you. How come Lenovo's doing so well and Dell is not? Uh, How come Lenovo is doing so well and Dell is not? I don't really know other than the fact that Lenovo has got a great cost position. Questions right there? Yes, sir. Do we have a microphone? Thank you. <laughs> uh, this question is for uh, both of you. Um, I was wondering... Can you speak can up? You speak I'm up? sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, I was wondering, is it important today uh, with the competition to go and get your master's degree and if you think it is would you rather see uh, an employer after they graduate go get a few years of experience then getting a master's degree or staying in school right after getting their undergrad then going to get their graduate degree if you know you're gonna get your master's is it better to go right after college no, or go, go work, work. For yeah go work I mean, get some experience, and, and the people that go directly from from college to master's degree, well, you did that. You didn't go to college. You no, I worked. I worked for seven years before I went back to business school, and thank goodness I did, because the, all the cases would have been completely lost on me, because when you're learning, what you're learning in the classroom, you're sitting there applying it to all the, especially around leadership and marketing, you're just applying it. But I'm not sure that's the question you're asking. Are you, are you asking, is there more competition to get in, or is there more competition for students coming out? Well, uh, what I'm trying to ask is, since there's a lot of competition now uh, with jobs and trying to get one, would you suggest students who are graduating to go get experience first, then getting okay. their master's, or staying right. in school right after getting their undergrad to get their master's? Right. Okay, you're right. I mean, I, I think that you've got to, um, the, the ideal thing is to get some work experience and then get your master's, especially your MBA, so you can get the most out of that uh, degree. But 
right now, I mean, it's just, it's, uh, it's it, I know it's hard to get a good, a good job too. So I mean, I, I see that some people just are sort of staying in school, uh, you know, go directly from college to, to school just because there's no jobs out there. It's not getting much better though. So if you fight to get a job before you get your master's, I would say. I wanted to get my MBA, and then I got a job, and I just never went back to get my MBA. I told you to get one at our school. Yeah, you can get one at our school. That's right. Yeah. I want, I'm going to get the Jack right, and well. Susie Welch MBA, actually. <laughs> um, yes, sir. I've been telling you that for years. You have. I know. <laughs> Uh, hi, how are you? My name is AJ Palumbo. There's a gentleman over here. And there's, but he's speaking back. Okay. Oh, hello. Uh, okay, uh, you guys were talking about how factories can be put together immediately overseas because they don't have the hurdle of regulation to overcome. But I was wondering, I mean, recently I saw an article where a factory overseas, I think yesterday, collapsed because there wasn't any regulations in place. And, uh, you know, it just wasn't up to American standards in the way that we've always tried to protect our people. It's very difficult yeah. to hear. If you could put the microphone closer to your mouth. I'm so sorry. I don't hear. I don't know if you guys are here. I, I, I couldn't we, hear. It's very hard to hear you. Sorry, I'll try again. That's better. <laughs> All right, so uh, you were talking about how... Uh, <laughs> I, 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 let me just, I've heard your question. You're saying is there, there was a factory in Bangladesh that collapsed yesterday and that's what happens when there's not regulation. Right, and also you mentioned that uh, you would like there to be regulation in the case of cybersecurity and I was trying to figure out where the two paths, how do you discern between industries that should be regulated, industries that shouldn't, and where is the line crossed where you have your, your case and your to? It's a great question, and one person's idea of regulation is another person's idea of opportunity. Uh, but I think you've got to put regulations through a test. Are you putting in a regulation that's going to grow the economy, grow jobs, and not impact safety? If you put that screen through it, if you put that screen through it, you'll have a pretty good analysis of what is right and what's wrong. The idea of the Labor Department telling retailers that they have to have 29 hours of work or else the person is a full-time employee so that a Home Depot that has, hundreds, that has thousands and thousands of people working 35 and 38 hours has to now take people down to 29 hours or else their costs go crazy in the hopes that they'll hire more people. That's not a way to get employment. That is such that's a good a point. That's a dumb, stupid rule. So if, if that's something you put through, through a clause and you say, am I creating jobs? Am I growing the economy with this move to go from 35 hours to 29? And that's not about safety. I mean, obviously, not there have to be regulations to protect people's lives. I mean, it, that is an, it, that's like integrity. It's a ticket to the game. You do not have buildings that don't have fire alarms. You don't have uh, any kind of, um, you know, the American standard is the world standard, should be the world standard around, uh, around safety, around people's lives. We're talking about regulations that um, basically fund government growth. Good, and good American companies never build anywhere other than to the highest global standard. It's an absolute fact. Yes, sir. And then I'll... Who's on this side? Okay, go there next. Are you ready? Yes, sir. You're ready for me. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, yesterday on the floor of the Senate, uh, Senator Sanders from, uh, from Vermont rattled off a list of companies that have dozens, if not hundreds, of corporations in the Cayman Islands and other places offshore. My question to you is, General Electric being one of them and many others, my question to you is how are we going to get our American companies to bring back their money from overseas and how are we going to get them to declare a full fair share of what their earnings are without putting, uh, sequestering, if you will, money overseas? Uh, very simple. Have a territorial tax where you're not taxed twice, you're taxed at the rate of the country you're in, and that's what you do. 
very simple. It's a very simple fix. No, don't one. double tax American companies when no other country in the world double taxes. That's how you do that. There's so much money waiting to be unlocked to come to this country, but look, they've got to be smart too, right, companies, right? right? They've got They're not going right, to. The shareholders uh, want the companies to maximize their profits. That's what they're in business to do. Um, and uh, this double taxation that companies face is, is, is madness, and if it stopped, we wouldn't have the situation. Now, I asked Tim Geithner about that, and Tim Geithner said, we can't change the tax because we're leaving too much money on the table. That I don't get. So we can have the same taxes as the Germans have, the French have, and every other every, every other country developed country Japan develop. has. That's all. That's all companies are asking for: the same tax as their global competitors have. The tax you get taxed where you earn it, you pay the taxes. What's your sense about taxes? I mean, we keep hearing people don't pay their fair share. What do you think about that? Well, my taxes are over 50 percent, so I apologize to nobody. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our taxes are. Very I'm not I mean, clever I mean, enough to get in it. I, I mean, I, I myself am a fan of the flat tax. I think you know, I think taxes are. Uh, you, um, uh, taxes are just a Trojan horse for talking about all the other social issues and so forth. And uh, you want, I, I think that one thing that we never talk about because it's a very difficult, deep, nuanced, philosophical conversation is what does the word fair mean? You know, your definition of fair share is different from your definition of fair share. So uh, we talk about fair share like it's some d widely understood concept, but in fact, well, well, that is a, you know, philosophers have been deb debating fair sh what fairness means. So I, th this, is a, this is a conversation I don't know if America will ever It seems fully to me this is, this is dividing us. Oh, yeah. This, is, this keeps one, dividing us. Line. If you work for a company in New York, if you work as a W-2 employee, you're generally paying over 50%. In taxes, is that fair? I don't know if it's fair. That you've got to argue. What well, it's fifty-eight percent. It's yeah. uh, 50, 57 percent, I believe, because you've got thirty-nine point six federal, nine point eight state, three point eight city, and three point eight Obamacare. Obamacare. Yeah. Somebody thinks that's fair. I know. Uh, we're going to go this side for a moment, and then we'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Uh, this question's for Jack. Um, in 1980, you were named CEO of GE. Uh, the Cold War raged, inflation was at 13%, unemployment was over 7% as it is today. Um, how would you compare our recession then to our recession now and the strategies that we took yeah. as a country then and that we're taking now and do you think that we're heading the right way? It's a, it's a great question and I, and I always tell people that uh, when, when I came in in, in 1980, uh, inflation was 13%. The prime rate was 21 percent. Oh wow! 21. Think of that. That's unimaginable. Inflation was 13. Unemployment was 12. And the, the, the same number that's now 7.7. .7. And the Japanese were going to take over the world. The world we were all done. They had bought the 30 Rock. They had bought Pebble Beach. And the Japanese had won everything. Forget it. Go home. Close your suitcase. It didn't happen didn't happen. They had policies that killed them, and we unleashed an economy, whether you like Ronald Reagan or not, and whether you think he's too far right wing or not, whatever you think about him, he unleashed the energy of a country to become competitive and win. And it happened. And look, I'm optimistic about America now. We got China, we talk about China all the time, we can kick their butt if we get an energy policy. If we become the lowest energy producer in the world with the gas we have found all over the world, in, in, in Shendu last week, the, the mayor was screaming at me saying, why don't American uh, drillers come over here and show us we have twice the gas reserves? Yeah. Teach, that, us, teach us how to frack, he said. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, he said, we have to frack. We, we've got it all underneath here. We need help. We got it. We've got the drilling. If you go to uh, North Dakota, if you go to Texas, if you go to the, Mar the Marcellus Fields, they're, they're unbelievable. N upstate New, New York, if this government would let them go, would become a buffalo, wouldn't look like a ghost town. It'd be alive and breathing. We need the policies that say we want a safe 
safe to that point back up there, energy policy that says we want to be self-sufficient. We don't want to send that money to our enemies or even our friends. We, want to, we don't need to do that. We can keep that money here. We can have low-cost energy. When you have low-cost energy, it isn't just the gasoline in your car. It's every factory in every corner of America that now has energy cheaper and can beat the hell out of the Chinese and others who have high-cost energy. So the, the benefits of a real energy policy to capitalize on the gas and oil we have would change the entire game overnight. All we need are politicians that buy into that. We want to make America great. America will be great. All the negative stuff about America, this is transient. We'll solve it. We got the smartest people in the world. We got the energy reserves. We got everything in that, that we need. We got the smartest people, without question. We got the game. Look, look at these schools. Where does everybody come to school from? They, they come here to learn. Our, our post high school schools are, are, are out of sight. So we've got everything. We need an energy policy. Beg for an energy policy, and you'll see the whole thing turn around. How many people in the audience think that we should approve Keystone and do fracking in this country? How many people don't think so? Talk to them. They said why, we should do it. Why don't they, why don't, why don't what, you? Someone who raised your hand, what, why? Why, why not? Why, 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 why not are we Keystone? Not? Let's stay with Keystone. Let's do Keystone. How come? Microphone right here. What, what are you worried about? Thank you so much. Thanks for doing that. Thank, thank you so much for coming. Um, my, my major concern, have you seen the movie Get Gasland? It's, you know, there's, these uh, environmental right. concerns. Sorry, there, there, there That's is the, there, these environmental concerns where uh, you know uh, w it, it gets into the uh, water system, and um, you know pe people uh, get get diseases. They showed how they lost hair. Uh, these farms, the horses were dying, or because the fracking um, materials got got into the groundwater. So it's really the the environmental concerns. Can you translate that? Yeah. He, he said, look, something could get into the water supply. It's the environmental concerns. Now, I do believe that the White House commissioned a study to check the safety of doing Keystone. And I, and I do believe that that report came back and said, it is safe. But it's really well, yours to take. Well, let's take key, Keystone. Let's separate them into two different things, Keystone and fracking. Those are two different issues. Keystone. The gas and oil is being taken out of the sands in Canada. It's either going to go west to China or it's going to come here. But the, the same oil Canada's policy is we're drilling. So do we want to take it and become more self-sufficient in North America or do we want to send it to China? That to me is a simple question. That doesn't even take <laughs> that, that 10 is... brain cells. That just says Keystone comes here. Fracking, you have an argument. Is fracking safe? Well, how safe is it? People are drinking it to prove it. Governors are drinking it. Governors in Iowa, governors in, in, in North Dakota are drinking it. Now, whether or not that's true or not is another question. Whether or not it's perfect or not, I can't argue that. And I think you've got to get satisfied on that yourself. You have every right in the world to be concerned about water tables. The argument I get, because I've studied a lot, I've spoken to these groups, I've worked with one of the groups, is that the water table is here at this level. Fracking goes several times deeper below the water table. So the water table is never touched because it comes back up the pipe and the water table is, ne is, is never touched. Even though they would argue the fluids are perfect, the mud and the sand that, th that gets the stuff out. Now, I, I can't stand here and, and, uh, and argue with you and say, damn it, fracking safe, it's perfect. I don't know enough, but I know enough that we never touch the water table. I know that's a fact. 
Now, you've got to satisfy yourself to that, to and, that whether it's safe enough. And to me, the question is, if fracking is not safe enough, I mean, none of us want to hurt our water, right? If it's not safe enough, is it possible in the next five years to develop the technology to make it safe? If so, let's put the money into that. That's a government policy decision. Can we get it there? Yes, it's going to take a big investment. Okay, fine, let's invest it. But by the way, accidents will happen. As they do with every Airlines point. crash. Okay. Things happen, yep. so yep. that is also something to just know. It, it, it's reality. Question right there. It's the energy story is an important one. I'm glad. I'm glad. I'm glad you brought it up. Um, with the student debt currently surpassing one trillion dollars and the 90-day default rate at. 11%, yep. do you believe that this will be the next financial bubble? Student debt, yep. exceeding a trillion? Uh, student debt is potentially a huge potential bubble. He said, is this the next big financial collapse coming? And there is an argument that, you, that that could be true. Now, that will not be true if we get this economy going. And if I can out argue this gentleman about an energy policy, and if a bunch of other people can outvote him in his views, that won't happen. But as long as we're going to stop progressive moves to improve the economy, I think you've got a real risk on your hands. Thoughts? I think that education costs too much. And uh, the, one of the reasons is uh, that uh, um, uh, there's obviously inflation built in, but there's that schools and, um, are wildly um, overstaffed. And I, I remember when I dropped our son off in college, um, they said, don't worry, your son will be watched over. There's this dean, that dean, the under dean, the super the dean, and there were like 600 deans. There were more deans than there were students. And I think that um, the problem is the, pa I mean, I think it's all well and good, um, and their intentions are good, but the, those costs are passed along to the parents, and, and, and it is an unsupportable system, and it has to change. When, when we were in interviewing the dean of our, for our online school, where we hired last year the dean from Cornell to be a head of the Jack Welch Management Institute, we interviewed four people from Ivy League schools, from Harvard, from Columbia, from Penn, and from Cornell. The first one that came in, the gentleman was a very smart fellow, associate dean at a, well, one of those four prestigious schools, and his first question to me was, what is your tenure policy? Now, I didn't hit him. I didn't shoot him. He ran out of the house like that. But I told him, it's, it's one hour. One hour. You deliver or you're out. That's the program. Now, either that's the game, or, you, or if you don't like that game, find another game. But here, and that was the end of that interview. It was over instantly. But that was his first question. What is our tenure policy? We don't have one. You're hired at will, the same way everyone is in every company in America. Why should this fat, lush habit still exist? It's antiquated. It's old. It's... Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, Jack, you're with the whole lot of academics. <gasps> well, I, I figured out the technology. I figured out how to turn this on. Uh, my question is, if you were starting a business today, which field would it be in? Where is this why? question coming right here, from? There. Look, Maria. Okay, thank you very much, sir. Well, I just started a business in education, so I've already selected what I want to do. I've started, I, I'm, a, uh, I'm a speaker, I like doing that. I go, we go around, around the world, Susie Su Su and I are in a two-team act, she interviews, I interview back. Uh, that's what we're doing, doing in China. Um, I, I think you do what you love to do. So back to Su Susie's first answer. That's what it's all about. You, 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 I got to be lucky in, in the business and I made a few decisions and they worked. They felt good when they worked, so I kept making more of them. Isn't that about the way it works for all of us? We try something, it works, we feel bigger again, we feel better again. You get to feel six foot four with hair eventually, <laughs> even when you look like this. And so, I mean, that's what happens to you. You build your confidence from what you love to do. And I think the idea of kids a a ask me a lot, geology hot now? I said, 
Don't even worry about whether geology is on it. If you don't like geology, get the hell away from it. You know, it, oh, is biotech the place yeah, to be? Do you love biotech? Well, no, no, I don't like biology at all. Yeah. <laughs> then get the hell out of there. <laughs> yes, right here in the front. Okay, we're, we're going to go there and then we'll I come back. We're, I think we're yes. all over the state. Yes, we are. We are. We're just, we have time for two more questions. Okay, I'm um, an owner of a manufacturing company in New Jersey, God love me. Um, it is almost impossible for us to hire. We have jobs open and many of my, my friends that own companies have the same problem. We cannot hire. We have openings and we just can't find people. You can't find the skill sets? And it, or, nor um, kids come in with no experience and they want $100,000. Um, skills, they don't exist. Um, it, it's impossible. And, and it's not just me, it's just all over the place. And we're the unsung group. Nobody, nobody hears us, nobody understands us. You, I don't know whether it's because monster... What's the question? The question is, what would you do? Yeah, I think you've got to look in different places. I mean, I think that you're encountering this sort of bubble of, I'm, I'm guessing, you're in a bubble of Northeast where people have high uh, expectations about what they're going to be paid because of the cost of living in this area, and they don't necessarily have the skill sets. If you're in a manufacturing company, uh, there's just not a lot of manufacturing uh, uh, minded people in this neck of the woods. And so I'm, I, one time Jack and I were giving a speech in Milwaukee, and there were a bunch of engineers who'd been put out of work and they were saying, you know, where do we look, where do we look? And Jack said, oh, you got to leave Milwaukee. I mean, I think you may have to, I, I don't know if you're doing national searches, but it, uh, if you're not finding the people in your backyard, you're, there are hungry people who, who, will, um, uh, who will be interested in your jobs, just not, not here. That would be my thought. My, 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 my two cents to add to that, and we had that experience in Milwaukee where they didn't want to leave. Oh, and they didn't want to leave Milwaukee. Yeah, but the, uh, my experience is, if you got a clear mission, where you're going, have you got a clear vision of why you're going there? Do you have a set of behaviors for the employees that say how you're going to get there, the where, why, and how? And then if you got something, what's in it for you, the employee that you're talking to? Have you got a real story to turn them on? to blow their brains out about how exciting what you're doing is and the, why you're doing it, how you're doing it, the behaviors, and then how you're going to take care of them if they deliver. You got to turn them on. Yeah. Unemployment, unfortunately, is too attractive. What? You're right. Unemployment, Unemployment is too attractive. Is too attractive. Unemployment is too attractive. And yeah. you can live, uh, that's yeah, quite, you can that's, live a that, that's a very good I, point. Very I, good I'm point. glad you made that, because yeah, if I made, made, made that, the, the guy in the, the, the environmentalist would have given me hell back. <laughs> <laughs> but is there a training program that she could institute to train what is required for her company? But that's the problem. If you're middle, if you're, um, I mean, we're not small, and we're certainly not GE. No, but and, you know, I'm, a training program GE, is I mean, expensive, and yeah. it takes a lot of time, yeah. and it takes people that can take the time. It's, it's very difficult. Yeah. yeah. Very difficult. Well, you, you've got an argument. Uh, if, if unemployment is more attractive, then you're talking about lower level jobs. Unfortunately, I'm not. Wow. What a stunning comment. That's unemployment amazing. is it's too like, attractive. It's like Denmark. I mean, so we have time for one, one more, more question. question. And there she is. Hi, Jack. My name is Deborah Mirabella. I just wanted to personally thank you because I had the privilege of working under your leadership at GE. I had an internship from Wagner and was a member of your FMP program. So I can definitely attest that in-house training programs work because it has served me well. So for that, thank you. Um, my question is true. Thank you. Absolutely. My question is a little selfish, it's twofold because my retirement accounts are curious. If you think the GE stock will ever rebound to the... <laughs> I'm so glad 
glad you asked that. The place it was yeah, when you we were the leader. Well, Is stock. GE stock ever going to go back to 59 and three quarters? And, well, when I was there, it was up over 100 before it split. <sighs> and today it closed just shy of 22. So my question is that, do you think it will rebound? And do you think the stock prices drop is a direct result of losing you? Oh my God. <laughs> Thank you. And is the stock price <laughs> decline you know right a direct result of the company that. losing you? <laughs> well, I'd like to say that I'm I- I'm glad you asked that and not me. <laughs> I retired in 2001 and I've never been back to the office one day. I turn the page, there's another life, another team, doing it their way. Uh, they change the offices, they paint the planes, they do what they want. And I don't second guess and don't look back and uh, life goes on. Well, life, I mean, you're a shareholder. Modest. Not very much. So you sold the stock, much of it? Uh, late in life. <laughs> So you don't have a comment of if the stock is going to go back to its highs. Then. I have no idea where the stock's going, and I wish you luck, and thank you for your nice comment. <laughs> and thank Ladies you and all. gentlemen, thank you very much, Jack and all. Susie Welch. Before Richard comes up, I would like to make a comment. Jack had a chance to talk to two of our students, Michael Lebovitz and his product cycler, and Liz Cardiello with the Nest, and they're both products of our Accelerated MBA program, so just want to them. Thank you very much once again, and Richard would like to say something before you leave. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you. What a fabulous panel. Thank you all for being here. It meant quite a bit to us. To the lady in the front row, do I have employees for you? <laughs> Right. Today, three, tonight, three students told me they got jobs today. One with Merrill Lynch, one with Morgan Stanley, and one with the United Nations. So we're, we're okay. We have students for you. But I wanted to thank uh, Jack and Susie and Maria. We have some gifts for you, and we're just so honored that you graced us with this evening. It's just Fun. wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much.